And thank you to the organisers for inviting me. It's been the first time I've been to a machine learning and stats event for quite a while. So I'm being dragged back into the, the area. Um, for the last few years, I've been spending a lot of time with the HCI community. And um, today's tutorial is really going to be a, an, an exploration of what it feels like engaging with um, human-computer interaction research, having come at it from a machine learning background, and in a sense giving you some motivation for engaging with it, but also some warnings about what to avoid. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, I mean, machine learning can give people new ways of controlling systems. We can have new sensor systems, rich touch input, so-called natural user in um, interfaces, where you maybe use something like Microsoft's Connect, a vision-based uh, system. You can use speech input, unless you're Glaswegian, and then the speech systems don't understand you. How many of you are actually understanding me? Some. Okay, we're getting there. Um, wave your hand if I become too quiet or uh, become too Glaswegian. Brain-computer interfaces I'll touch on, so directly controlling um, a computer with brain activity, um, and other similar rich interfaces for people with um, particular needs, like disabled users. We can make the existing systems that we have faster, we can use power more efficiently, use bandwidth more efficiently if we use machine learning to customise systems to users. Importantly, we can personalise the experience somebody has to what matters to them, to their preference, to their priorities. And now that everybody is connected all the time, we can transfer what we learn from one person uh, to others. So you can benefit from the experience millions of other people had, have had with the particular web page, with the particular uh, mobile apps that you're using. Why is it difficult for machine learners? Well, there's lots of unlabeled data. Uh, we've got complicated value functions. So if you think about human beings, they're not just simple quadratic cost functions. They've got very complicated preference structures. You've got this heterogeneity. Everybody's different. Everybody has different priorities. And if you start to adapt a system while the user is adapting to it, then you get problems. You start to get chase effects. Um, you've got interesting closed-loop identifiability problems because you're generating feedback as a function of the user's behavior, but then trying to learn the, the user's behavior, which is correlated with that feedback. And control engineers have known for a long time that doing closed-loop identification is much more challenging than open-loop. And once you've built a system, evaluating whether people actually think it's an improvement is challenging as well. So the evaluation of the performance and of user satisfaction is a complex area. So let's start off with user models. We can learn about user behavior, human behavior, using machine learning. We can learn how people behave in particular situations. Um, that can be useful for scientific purposes. It can be useful for prioritizing how you send which people which adverts. You can annotate human activity. So everybody carries a smartphone nowadays. We're seeing more wearable devices, which have got even richer data collection possibilities. Um, smart environments, future cities are all the, the latest buzzwords. These are uh, large-scale logging of activity, ideally to make life more efficient in some sense, um, or to help you understand your, yourself, your life better. We can use models of users to predict what they're about to do and serve them better in that sense. Um, that could also be about traffic systems in, uh, in driving. It could be about preloading something to your device so that it seems as if your performance is faster. So we want to look at using models. If you understand how people behave in a particular context, that helps you infer what their actual intention was, not just the overt behavior that you see. And if you've got a model, then you can use that to learn what people actually prefer. So if you can develop use, useful user models, then you can use them in design. And this has been used for a long time in things like the aircraft industry or in driving, where people made um, models of human manual control behavior, so how 
able as somebody to fly this system. They would simulate a human pilot and put that into various test systems because once you couple a human being with the technical system, you change the dynamics of the closed loop system and you get effects which you hadn't um, expected. So in interface design, Okay, I'll see if I can. Are you hearing me better now? Does that help? Okay, so please do shout. I know I've, I get quiet and I've got a sore throat, so feel free to wave your hands. Um, so, for example, if you have a model of how people touch, what the, their touch accuracy is, you can use that to change the layout of a smartphone for a particular size of device and get more efficient use out of it, easier targets to hit. Um, you can adjust models to cover a wider range of users because quite frequently designers have a tendency to design for somebody who's very like them. And so if you're trying to design for somebody who has 80-year-old arthritic fingers and is trying to touch a screen, you need a different model for that if you're trying to um, designed for somebody who's got a, a tremor, you need a different model for that. So having user models allows you to be more formal in the way you specify the uh, users you're aiming for and to, de to test designs with them. If you've got a model of what somebody likes, what they tend to do, then you can also recommend more interesting things to them. They can, you can give them people like you also like this and expand their horizons, help them learn. So <clears throat> user models are a first stage in that process. And this personalization to an individual user is one of the hot topics in, um, in interactive systems. Everybody's different. We'd like to rapidly customize the system to a new user with as little data as possible. So you don't want to have to ask people lots of explicit questions. You'd like to be able to tell from their behavior. And that might be whether they came to your web page from Facebook instead of from Google+, that might tell you something about them, or whether they're on a mobile device, what sort of mobile device they're on. If they're on an iPhone or a Nokia N9, that tells you very different things about their likely personas. Um, and there's a, a range of things that you can look at with that. You've got offset models for um, touch screens, which we'll look at in a, in a few minutes. There's Biometrics, which could be used to infer, um, is, is this the right person? Can they, are they allowed to get this? Speech information, um, and things like Google Now and Android gives you, it learns where you typically seem to go during the day, where you t spend the night, and it views the, one of these as home, one of these as work, and starts to infer, okay, usually you get up and you do this at this time of day, here's some information about the traffic. Um, we probably need to look at getting some structure into these models so that we can build a family of models to describe users and quickly say, you're like this subsection of that family because that way you can tune in faster, but you've got an overall model which isn't crazy, which can be tested uh, before we've been released to the public. Um, and we're seeing this coming into home life. So how many of you have got a Nest thermostat that's been out in the States for a while? I'm just curious. Okay, not many. So this is a thermostat that um, the company's now been acquired by, by Google, but the designers were involved in the original iPod. And so it's an example of design and machine learning coming together into what might seem a fairly boring area, you know, keeping your house warm. But it's, it has a proximity sensor, so it can sense when you're in the house. Um, it then uses machine learning to build up a, a pattern of when you're typically around and how long your house takes to warm up and uses that to optimize your, um, your um, heating. And that means that they claim you can save between 20 and 30 percent over the typical setup people have. They're also now using that to couple in with demand control so that they work together with power companies um, especially in the States for things like air conditioning, to reduce the demand at peak times by giving you cheaper power earlier on. So once you start to include these devices in a networked world uh, with learning, you can um, make things more efficient, more controllable, and 
also more globally controllable. Previously, you test systems by getting 20 users into a usability lab and trying out design for the web page A and design B, and you would ask them lots of questions and you would look at performance on various t tasks, see how many clicks they needed to get to a task, how often they got confused. Nowadays, servers tend to be running with millions of users using the system every day, and they can decide to give 5% of the users a new web page, a different design, give the other 95 the current best guess, and then look at which ones improve performance best. <coughs> For games, you can see which levels an Angry Birds are people getting stuck at. You know, you want them to be challenged, but you don't want them to be impossibly challenged because then they just give up. So it's about getting the right level of pain and excitement into a game. And now with mobile devices returning these analytic um, feedbacks to the, to the developers, you can continuously optimize these designs for future use. And we're seeing, you know, Microsoft Research in Cambridge did some very sophisticated work on using Bayesian methods to optimally advertise to you on Bing. I don't know if they sorted out the search on Bing, but they got good adverts to you. Um, okay, context. Context is a big buzzword in, in the interaction world. Um, if you think about any conversation you have with another human being, you're often able to gloss over lots of the detail in what you're talking about because it's obvious from the context. You maybe have a history with the person you're talking to, you know each other well, you, you know, if you especially think about husband and wife, the amount of information in a mmm that you get back from your wife when she looks at you and you've said something or you've, you know it's because you appeared at half past 11 the day after you'd been in a conference in Iceland uh, for a week and um, you hadn't told them about that and that's mmm can tell you an awful lot. Um, now, you could argue how many bits are in that information? Well, it depends on the context. Uh, if it was somebody you'd never met before going, mm -hmm, then it might mean something quite different. And the actual detail is in the context. So that's in, in communication, in human communication, that's called common ground. Um, you can argue in a machine learning sense, that if you have a good, a well-chosen context vector, some information that describes that, it should reduce the number of bits that you need to communicate and control e each other in that context. So that would be one more objective way of thinking about context, that it should let you do what you need to do with fewer bits. Um, so it's typically information that can be used to characterize the situation of entities. Um, so that's location, identity, state of people, groups, and computational and physical objects. And it's often used as a proxy to guess what people want what their intent is. And they can sense and respond to aspects of the settings in which they're used, and they can tailor the behavior of a system to patterns of use. So if you think about getting a bus timetable, that used to be a real pain. You'd have to, uh, if, if you were using a computer system, you'd have to say where you were coming from, where you were going to. Often you wouldn't know what these places were called. You knew where they were physically, but you didn't know what the bus stop was called. Now you can just walk up, pull out your phone, the system uses GPS to find out where you are, finds the nearest bus stop, and then all you have to do is to give the, it also knows the time from the clock on the system, so it can cut down the amount of information required of you dramatically. All you have to do is to say where you're going and it will tell you which buses fit that. So that's a simple example of how context has reduced the number of bits of information that you had to generate. Context can also be something that you record. So, for example, for activity logs, um, you can record the context of if you take a picture in Iceland, it's also recording the GPS location. It could potentially record the audio around it. It might record who you were with. But for machine learners, what's interesting is that this context is always ambiguous. It's always uncertain. 
Um, and typically, the current generation of systems hides that uncertainty. Although the knowledge of that uncertainty is important for knowing how you can actually use this. And for helping the user understand why is the system behaving weirdly. So if you have a context sensitive system, it means that you are essentially moving in between modes. They might not be discrete modes, they might be continuous modes, but modes where the same inputs from the user lead to different responses from the system. And if the user does not have a good model of context that matches what the system's context is, then from their perspective, the interactive system is just becoming unpredictable. Sometimes it does one thing, sometimes it does another, and they can't understand why. So making the state of the context visible to the user is, is quite an important part. Another bit of the context for, for what I'll be talking about is the notion of ubiquitous computing or ambient intelligence. So we're seeing the physical and the digital worlds becoming more merged. You're putting computation into the environment, you're putting sensing into the environment. We're carrying computers around with us in our pockets, on our heads if you're wearing a Google Glass. Um, and in the same way as we've got used to over time being able to walk towards a supermarket door and have it open automatically, or you can wave your hands under a tap and it will have a sensor which gets it to uh, wash your hands. How does this generalize to richer forms of interaction? Um, so will children be alerted when they're going too far away from their, their parents or their house? Tourists are automatically being informed about points of interest when they're walking through a city. There are lots of appealing sounding scenarios, but one of the difficulties is making that work in real life with the complexity of everyday living. So IBM's Blue Eyes project had a setup where it would use uh, eye tracking and detect when you were looking at your TV. And so you could switch on your TV just by looking at it. Engineer thought, that's a great idea. Let's build that. Okay. Somebody's then sitting in their living room, reading a book, very relaxed, <coughs> get caught in thought, happen to be looking towards the TV, TV blasts on with MTV. They're thrown out of their, their reading, they're annoyed at this intrusive house getting on their nerves. They don't buy that product again. So the richness of everyday life is complicated. We need ways to, we want to use intelligence, we want to learn, we want to try and <coughs> do things which make life easier for the user. But you need to remember that sometimes you're uncertain and the consequences of doing the wrong thing can be a pain. Yep. Okay. Um, so basically, at the moment, <clears throat> despite being at an AI stats conference, I don't think we do SMART very well. Um, there's a huge amount of variability in what people do, and learning a model which is not uncertain enough is almost worse than learning nothing. So an awful lot of the if we're going to do useful things with this, it's going to need machine learning techniques which are also very clear about how uncertain they are. And the system needs to make sensible decisions about how to use the little information that they can provide. So if you think about, as a human being, watching other, if you were you know, in a sort of big brother world where you could just watch another family going about their lives, how certain would you be that you could predict what people were going to do at any moment? that you could offer, if you were building what's called, in, in HCI they often build Wizard of Oz systems because that avoids them having to pay for people from AI and machine learning. They pretend that something works by having uh, another human being standing behind a, a screen making things happen as if it was an intelligent system doing it. And that is actually a really useful way for rapidly prototyping an idea. But it also makes you realize how difficult it is, even for humans, to infer what somebody is trying to do what their intentions are. And if it's difficult for humans, then you can be sure it's going to be difficult for, uh, no matter how fancy your Gaussian process or BaysNet or whatever it is, it's going to be difficult for that as well. OK, so let's, let's start talking about some, some of the examples of things that we've been working on in the past. And one of the major areas for the use of machine learning is dealing with rich inputs. So you've got complicated um, inputs where a simple threshold like pushing a button isn't enough. Um, that could be 
interpreting rich audio input as you rub a device using information from a full body motion from a Kinect, EEG data from a, a brain computer interface, and general motion from accelerometers and other inertial sensors. So these are sensors, <coughs> they're too rich to just do simple thresholding on. You need to have a complex function. Obviously, speech recognition and vision systems are prime examples of, of that, but I won't be focusing on that in this talk. Um, this is part of the, the application sets that's common to many other machine learning ones of things which are easier to learn than to program. So it seems easier to gesture some, ge provide a gesture a few times and to learn from that than to describe in detail how that should happen, especially given that the gestures are going to be um, generated by people other than yourself. Um, another area related to this is effective computing, which is computing that takes into account human emotional states. And that can be important both for the sensing on the computer side, but also the feedback where it can generate um, effective feedback. OK, so when people think about gesture recognition and um, natural user interfaces, that's often seen as an area of big, <coughs> big impact of machine learning and interaction design. But if you look at something like the Wii, which was a simple accelerometer-based input which allowed you to play tennis by waving your hand as if you were playing tennis. And actually, the inference that was going on there was incredibly primitive. It had a very simple thresholding structure. But because the designers put that in a game context where you were supposed to be getting yourself into the game, then you would move your hand as if you had a tennis uh, racket in it. And you, you got immediate feedback from the system where somebody would move a tennis racket and you think, OK, great, this works, isn't that clever? Until you play a five-year-old at the boxing game and they've realised, because they tend to, as kids do, they tend to just explore more, that instead of having to go, oh, 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 they can just waggle their hands, play with the thresholding on the device and beat the hell out of you. <laughs> so the, and at that moment you lose, the metaphor falls away and you think, oh, this is crap, you know, that's not what I want. Um, so, but the key things to learn from that is you can have really, really bad inference, really bad machine learning if you get the story right and if you persuade people to buy into a particular metaphor. The contrast is you can have the most sophisticated machine learning in the world, but if you don't get the user to understand the story behind what you're trying to get them to do, they will not fill in the gaps in your machine learning very well, and they'll tend to get stuck quite quickly. So that's quite an important takeaway message. So if you look back, this is, we worked together with Samsung um, in the early days, and they brought out the first phone that had gesture recognition in it to the, to the market. Uh, this was 2005-ish. And they did what every, everybody was doing at that moment, which was take the latest fancy dynamic Bayesian networks, um, do some machine learning, train on some gestures so you can see the, um, the gestures here. You pick your favorite complicated network, generate some training set, do some testing, and as usual, 98% success. That's great. But in this context, you never believe anybody saying they've got 98% success rate because if you look at even just normal human-human communication, there's more errors than that, but we have ways of dealing with the errors. Um, so that even if in perfect conditions you can get 98% on this, what that means is the next time the user uses it, they're going to push their luck a bit, they're going to be sloppy, they're going to be more relaxed. And that means that they will eventually fall off the performance. And if you've only got feedback at the end of the gesture, then the people don't know what was it about my gesture that didn't work. Um, so you get so this so this was one of the examples from the marketing for the device. And the guys I spoke to said, you know, it was great. We some, for Samsung, it's very important to be the first in anything, and we were the first, so that was important. But actually, users didn't find it particularly useful. You know, they showed it off to their friends in the pub. Everybody went, wow, you can draw a three in the air. But that was about it. It didn't really add long-term value for the users. And what struck me was 
your hands are very expressive. You can generate lots of bits per second with your hands. You can do lots with them. But most of the gesture recognizers that are out today are just taking that rich signal and mapping it down to a simple digit, you know, or a letter or something. So you've taken something very rich and you've, you've turned it into a glorified button. You're not using it to the level you could potentially use it. So, so why switch from buttons? Well, obviously, if you're using, this was before the move towards rich touch and where buttons were disappearing in general. Um, but you could argue a button on the screen might be as good as a gesture. If you're making very small devices, if you're using things which you don't want to have a physical device for, then gestures become important again. But the problems were the early systems didn't give you any formative feedback, so that means as you're generating the gesture, you weren't getting any sort of feedback. It would, you'd do something, mm -hmm. and then at the end it would say recognized or not recognized. They often didn't pass on their uncertainty to other layers in the system, and that's going back to a problem in computing science. Information hiding is seen as a good thing, where you encapsulate complexity in one part of a system and you don't propagate it further, but in probabilistic reasoning, you know you have to do that if you want to have sensible uh, decisions made later on. Uh, so they didn't release how uncertain they were. They didn't help people learn. So <clears throat> they didn't shape behavior in beginners. So if you're going to learn to do a gesture, how do you get there from not being able to do that? Especially if it's a, a 3D gesture over time, um, it's harder to display on the screen. What happens if you've got a shopping bag in your hand and you're trying to perform the gestures? That's going to affect the dynamics of your hand and it's probably not going to work um, with the standard one. How can the user understand how to modify their behavior to make it work? What if the user's notion of the gesture varies from the, what, what the technical system is sensing and experiencing? So you might think this is all about the physical relationship of my hand to my body but the system might be measuring acceleration. So if you use it when you're in a bus that's accelerating and braking, then there's an, o an extra set of information which you don't think matters, but which the system thinks matters a lot. Um, okay. So I felt the drive for taking all the latest fancy techniques in machine learning and throwing them at classifiers might be misguided as a first step in this area. And having a background in control engineering, I thought, well, um, maybe we should view this as a control system, that the, um, the user is controlling the system, and it might be via rich uh, gestures, it might be uh, via simple button pushes. Um, but let's view the, co the computer and the system as two systems trying to control each other. Um, they've got a common aim, and that means that the interaction is not this command and control system, CD, directory, A, you know, RM, star dot star. It's about a negotiation. It's more like a dance that at times the computer leads you, at times you lead the computer, hopefully to achieve some common goals. So here's a, a simple image of that. So you've got a human. They've got some intention. They've got effectors, let's say a hand, they can wave it, they can move it. The system they're engaging with has sensors, that might be a button, it might be an accelerometer, it might be a connect. And the, it, the computer has a state, and it can feed back that state to the user who can perceive it somehow and see how that compares with what they wanted the, the state of the world to be in. And you might imagine that a, a perfect um, interface would be a direct line where you can just have an intention and the computer moves into that state. Um, that's maybe not quite true because there are sometimes things the computer knows that you don't know and that might be important in you changing your intentions. But anyway, if you think about the task of the interface being controlling the flow of information between the user and the, um, the computer and the system has the intention of ascertaining the user's intention with a minimal amount of effort on the part of the user, so as few bits as possible are needed for the system to learn what the user wants. Um, and we've set this up as a continuous control process. You're recursively updating belief states uh, about the intention and providing feedback about the state you're in in understanding their um, intention. 
And this is, I think, interesting because we're seeing the world change from previously interactive systems were designed with a fairly stable setup. You had a computer, you had some windows, you had a keyboard, you would move the mouse around, you would do some basic things, and you could tune the performance um, over time, try it out with a range of users and make sensible design decisions. But now we're moving into an environment where you've got potentially infinite numbers of sensors of very varying uh, quality. You might have quite precise control via a touchscreen, more uncertain information via accelerometer or GPS input. You might have sensors in the building that you're in. You might have information that might be you but could be somebody else standing beside you. So there's uncertainties. There might be people who are providing information um, which is deliberately misleading. So you might spoof a car or several cars on a road to make that look busier, to make other people go other ways. Um, so we've got a f an environment coming in now with very large numbers of sensors and rich forms of feedback, vibrotactile feedback, rich audio feedback, which haven't been as well explored. And I think the traditional models for designing user interfaces won't work. We need to come up with a, a new one. So we've got to cope with high dimensional data, noisy data, and intermittently available data. And that can be from both sides. Sometimes the user's entering information, sometimes that's lost. Sometimes the system is displaying information, which in certain modalities is lost on a bright day. You can't see the screen on your phone. You might have an audio alert, which you don't hear because it's noisy around you. There might be a vibration one, which you do uh, feel even though the, the device is in your um, jacket pocket. So the, the approach I've taken in this is to say, OK, human beings have evolved to control our perceptions. So the behavior that we generate is what happens when we control what we perceive. So we need feedback, and there are upper limits on our bandwidth, because there are limits to how rapidly we can perceive the state of the world, and there are limits on uh, how, how rapidly we can um, act. We're seeing the user interacting with an interface object as two coupled dynamic systems. We've taken a physical model-based approach to representing interface objects because we're used to engaging with physical objects in the world. And if we do that, the dynamics lets you slip in intelligence into the closed loop, which might not have been easy to bring in in a static interaction. We've taken a probabilistic perspective because there's always uncertainty in the user's mind about what to do next. The system's uncertain about the user's intentions. And so we need to adapt the dynamics based on this inference. Um, and that will mediate the flow of evidence between participants in it. And we've used this in multimodal settings. So multimodal, not in the statistical sense, but in the uh, perception sense. So that's all, you know, hearing, vision, touch. Um, so you can communicate in a number of channels. So just to give um, an, a little example of some systems which have used other mechanisms to help the user perform gestures, um, look at a few examples. One was body space. This was work that was done some years ago, um, where we had a gesture-based system. But what it did was it stored information around your body. So it goes, goes back to the mnemonics uh, that people use to remember speeches with different parts of the body being parts of your speech, or different rooms in a palace, memory palace being parts of the speech. So you could store information around parts of your body and look at the gestures that were generated when you did that, sensed with an accelerometer. So you can see a user going to various points around the body and the acceleration signals that were seen from multiple attempts to do that. And if you try just integrating up these signals, then you don't get anything particularly useful because of the usual problems in integrating things up. But if you use a neural net, um, in this case we had a, quite a simple hack which realized that the orientation of the device around the different parts of the body was already a big giveaway, so you could model the end point and then look at the last half second of movement before they got there. Yeah. Here's a, a music player that was built using that.
And so a lot of the early work in these sorts of systems would be combining, doing sort of simple hacks where you'd combine um, some evidence. So this was some work on detecting whether a phone had been turned over because early versions of the work were just saying, oh, well, if the accelerometer says it's this way around, then it's been turned over. But what would happen would be, and the idea was that would switch off the phone uh, from ringing. So if it was ringing, you could just turn it over to, uh, to switch it off. But the problem was, when phones ring, they often vibrate as well. That vibration was uh, uh, affecting the accelerometer, and the phone was thinking, oh, I've been turned over. So instead of that, you could use something which says, well, is the phone level down and stationary? Was it human controlled in the last second? So you can look at, you can model human motion and say, okay, what's the frequency content of that? Have a simple model that just detects it was in hand. And you can have some extra signal because these devices are sensitive enough to pick up your muscle tremor. So it was not just controlled, but it was also in the user's hand. And that sort of combined evidence can be used to uh, make a more certain decision. Um, another example of scaffolding the gestures on um, existing frameworks that people understand and helping them learn is the gesture keyboard, ShapeWriter and Shark. So this was work by Perola Christensen, this was not Glasgow, he's now at St Andrews, but this was done when he was a PhD student. And um, I'll show a little video of how that works. He, uh, he said, don't play the music because it's really cheesy, but I'm going to say powerful multi-purpose devices. Shape writing was invented to open up the bottleneck of information flow at mobile device interfaces. For each word in a large lexicon, a word pattern is defined by connecting the word's letters on a keyboard. For example, the word this is represented by the letter trace THIS. ShapeWriter uses intelligent algorithms to recognize these patterns. Writing words with ShapeWriter is easy. A novice can look at the keyboard and trace the word from letter to letter. Unlike speech recognition, error correction is relatively easy with shape writing. If a mistake is made, the user can select a different word from a list with one additional stroke. ShapeWriter takes advantage of people's remarkable sensitivity to shapes. With use, a person's skill gradually transitions from tracing letter to letter to memory-driven shape writing. ShapeWriter is error tolerant. It can still recognize the intended word, even if the word isn't drawn perfectly. ShapeWriter has an adaptive lexicon with 60,000 words. One can also add new words to ShapeWriter by tapping them letter by letter. ShapeWriter also works on tablet computers and other touch-sensitive devices. So, you know, you can tap away your, uh, your words, but uh, this lets you then build up a gesture and then learn that. So what's nice is you can ha you've got gesture-based input, but how you learn it is supported because you can uh, see the keys in front of you, you can build it around that, uh, but you're using the strength of the language model to help you have to be less precise because you can be approximate and it can disambiguate potential words by saying which are most likely given the, the language model. So you've got some context and then you write um, you want to write rabbit, so these would be the letters you want to go through, and um, you get the actual gesture, which does not have to be precise because of the language model being able to fill in the gaps. That then relaxes to the particular gesture, which would be the prototype gesture, giving the user some feedback about the ideal way to do that in the future. So what's quite nice about this is it lets a novice use the system without training, because if they want to, they can always revert to tapping on the keyboard, they can start to speed up as they see fit. If they've lost some skill at it, they hadn't used it for a while, then they can revert back without having a major restart. So I think this is a really nice example of using machine learning to reduce the number of bits per second you have to generate, but doing it with a framework that's easy for people to learn and to continue to get support while they're learning to use it. And um, you know the impact that's had, given that that was somebody's PhD project, is it's now installed in all Android devices by default. So anybody with an Android device can use this. Um, it's available in Windows phones. I think they just got the world record for speed texting last week using a variant of that. Um, 
And it's one of the only text entry methods that's managed to make an impact in the last 25 years. And it depended on machine learning, but it did that in a way that coupled it in with what was important for users. So that would not, I think, have just come out of a machine learning lab. It had to be machine learning coupled with insight into interaction design. And you can see related things in something like the Android gesture lock. There is a system which is, which is giving you feedback as you generate this gesture. You're feeling vibration as you go through the gesture. You're getting visual feedback about what it perceived. And that's because you need these elements of feedback to make sure that you get this right. Because if you do it more than five times, you're locked out of your device. <coughs> OK. <coughs> We're going to look at now how do you estimate the variety of gestures a given user and a given sensing system can generate? And this is from work um, by John Williamson on rewarding the original, um, which was presented at CHI. You've got a wide range of possible sensors for a device. When these are used by a given user, how many different states can the user generate with them? Um, so what we want to do is to look at the channel capacity. So with um, um, the bandwidth B being related to the variability, the number of states that you can generate, and you've got the signal and noise, which is the, the reliability, and that gives you the overall quality of this gesture system, the channel capacity. So are these visible? OK. So if you think about a gesture system, you want to have high variability. You'd like to be able to generate many states. Um, so, for example, this system here has lots of states, uh, codes that it can generate. This one has fewer. So you would like to have a r large range of things that you can generate. Uh, you'd like them also to be reliable because this one also has a large number of states, but the user is less able to generate these reliably. So the overall channel capacity is reduced. Um, you also, from these, have issues of transmissibility. So how quickly can the skills needed to discover um, these gestures be communicated. And that can be affected by feedback from the system and uh, learning it from other people. And the technical side of the recognizability, how well can the software map sensor sequences to classes that represent intention? So the user might be able to reliably generate a wide range of sensor sequences, but the system might have trouble actually classifying them. So we're going to. In this uh, uh, demo, address the variability part of it, not the reliability. So how could you measure the repertoire of measurable and performable movements for a given joint user sensor system? And the way that's going to be done is breaking down the gestures into movement primitives. So these are elements that you can use to reconstruct the gesture based on the running window. You, of, of course, there's the assumptions you make in the way you compress the signal in this point, and you measure distances between primitives, will affect the overall performance of the system. And there's a lot of role to improve what we've done using machine learning. Um, you'd like to get as close as you can to the underlying intentional space. Um, but at the moment, we're settling for a good space. Um, so we end up taking a short window. Um, we low-pass filter the information. So this is the window here. You do some low-pass filtering. You fit some. Uh, polynomials and take the, um, the coefficients of these as a measure for distances in the space. And then they could be put into some low dimensional projection like a self-organizing map. And so that means that you have a number of different movements, gestures associated with different parts of the space. And you want to count how many of these are there. But the, the way we wanted to explore this was we gave people reinforcement to do something creative. So you can use shaping and reinforcement learning to train humans as well. So here, somebody was given a, um, a sensor on their arm, and they could move it. And whenever they did something interesting, they were given audio rewards. A bit of music was played. And they had to keep doing things until they had explored as much of the space as they could. So here's a, a demo. There are many ways to swing about an arm. This is John Williams. When designing interactions for blind review. with novel input mechanisms, it would be useful to quantify, categorize, and analyze the space of all feasible and measurable movements. 
Our approach to solving this problem is much the same as the way a dolphin would be trained to perform tricks. Dolphins, naturally rather recalcitrant, can be effectively trained by positive reinforcement. By rewarding originality rather than conformity, the space of possible behaviours can be explored. We built a system using a small inertial sensor which can be attached to various body parts. And we developed an algorithm which rewards originality using sensible metrics. Users receive audio feedback which indicates that their movements are different from ones they have performed before. Eventually, users run out of motions to perform. We constructed a suite of tools to analyse the captured motions. We formed a low-dimensional projection of the motion features to construct a two-dimensional map. Movements can be cross-referenced against videos and sensor traces. Objective measures, such as the total energy of movements, or the level of rotation about specific axes, can be visualised and corresponding motions extracted. Here, a video feed is linked to the map in real time, so that designers can see where motion lies in the space of all motions. So that gives you a, a, a tool that lets you explore potential gestures, because often if you, I've had many frustrating meetings with designers at companies like Nokia where they say, well, let the user decide and they should know best and so on. But the problem is the user that you talk to might have one idea about what feels natural, that might be different from another, but also they don't know what the technical system is. And if you're trying to build a recognition system, you need to know how it's going to be sensed. And that might also be changing over time. So if you define a bunch of sensors which are useful, sorry, a bunch of gestures which are useful for the sensors you have on product A, product B with different sensing might be able to do something quite different. Also, this lets you explore what a user does. So you can look at then populations of users. So what happens if you had put that same sensor on an elderly person's arm, there would have been less mobility there. If it was a younger person's arm, it might be more uh, mobile. There are constraints which might be you're carrying some shopping, you're carrying a baby, you're whatever you're doing. How does that affect how much you can, how much of that sensor space you can explore? Um, and there might be social aspects that constrain you. There are certain things you, you know, some of the dancing that John was doing there. You notice he had his office door closed. Would he have done the same movements if he'd been? in the underground or uh, at a dinner party. So there are certain movements that you're prepared to do in certain contexts, but not in others. So you can essentially map out the properties of gestures. There might be some things which are everyday gestures. So these are everyday motions. So these are things which happen during your normal life. And you don't want them to be gestures because they're going to be fired off all the time by mistake. There are things which just can't can't be done. There are things which can be done but are very unlikely to happen. There are some that can be, oops, some that can be done but which are strenuous to do or problematic long term. There are some which are socially embarrassing to do. Um, and there are some which are good ones that you would use for a particular purpose. And you can look at the spaces at different, these are different individuals. Um, and you can see AJ and JM came up with fairly similar emotions and you did some different things. So different people find different things first. It means if you're looking for candidate gestures, a system like this can let you see, okay, somebody, you know, a designer has said, this is a good idea for a gesture. You can then say, how rapidly was that gesture discovered in our set of test users? If everybody discovered that within the first minute, that's actually quite a useful thing to know because it means it's likely to be discovered pretty quickly by a certain proportion of the population. If 
a large percentage of the population didn't get that until five minutes of use had gone by, then that's, unless you get the metaphors right, that's unlikely to be discovered by chance. Um, you also find a larger amount of the space active. It's, these don't look quite so good on the displays as on the screen, but uh, there's a larger amount of the space filled in the hand motion than the elbow because you have fewer degrees of freedom with your elbow than you do with your hand, so it's natural that you can generate more different gestures with your hand. So here we're looking at trying to quantify the, the bit rate that we can get from a given input. Why is that interesting? Well, as sort of going back to where we were, we want to have some intention in our brain. We use whatever actuators we have. That gets uh, measured um, by some sensor state. And what we would then want to do is to infer what one of n intentions could be given what we're seeing so far. So these might be, in this case, it might be a simple three-state system that says, OK, either you want one, two, or three, um, and you then gather the ev evidence. So if you're completely uncertain at the start, you're going to be in the middle of this simplex, and then you gradually move out towards whichever one is being supported by the evidence. And at some point, you've got enough evidence to make a decision, and you have a state transition um, in, the, in the, the system. So looking at an example where you've got sensors providing continuously varying measurements, you're trying to drive this state towards one of these um, vertices because that's associated with uh, a decision. So you've got the, the maximum um, entropy here, and you're trying to uh, minimize that. But one of the guiding principles for this is once you know the channel capacity of your input, you shouldn't be able to change the entropy of the overall decision faster than that bit rate. That should be an upper limit. So actually, you want to, to limit how rapidly you can change based on the evidence. Because if you're changing the entropy in your uh, decision system faster than the bit rate of your sensor, then something's going wrong. The information's not not coming from any evidence. OK, so machine learning and inference is vital for sensing and inference about user actions, interpreting the content, um, so looking at images or music and understanding that, and generating the feedback the user needs to exert the control. Uh, but so far, HCI has been pretty binary in, in, in its input and output, and it's got information hiding, so it's not propagating uncertainty to other levels of the system. But designers can't solve all these things in advance. You're going to need to have some automated guesses and the human helping them to, to say what's actually right. So we're going to look at some examples of uh, brain-computer interaction, uh, music applications, and rich touch. And also look at how should computers share responsibility with the human. So brain-computer interaction is a, a prime example of a rich interface. You've got EEG signals from a range of sensors over time, and you're trying to infer something about the human uh, state. Um, it's, it, when you do things in brain-computer interaction, it highlights that the current framework for HCI is not complete. You know, Using a, a BCI is not the same as using a mouse, and so it's going to be hard to generalize lots of experience with mice to that. The sort of signals you're getting from BCIs are more like these and not like nice, simple mouse movements. Um, so you've got to deal with noisy data, lagged data, very variable inputs, very variable between people, and you need to train and support the user when using them. Um, and it's interesting to look at multimodal feedback uh, because you might get, if you have an overactive visual display, that might affect the signals that, or the EEG is picking up and affect it such that the performance drops, so the, the, the actual controllability can be reduced by the feedback mechanism. Um, so here's an example of work we did together with uh, the TU Berlin um, in Germany. And it was looking at text entry on a BCI, where to use the system, the users have to imagine <laughs> right hand, left hand sensations and activity in the motor cortex is pick up, picked up at the EEG. The motor cortex is close to the surface, so it's easier to pick up. And you can um, use classifiers, so you've got spatial 
um, models and some uh, and simple linear classifiers on top of that, which then generate a binary input. So just to give you a sense of what is going on. Let's see. So here, using one of the inputs will extend the arrow, the other one will rotate it around. The language model will then um, once you've gone into a, a, a letter group, will expand um, the letters in the order of likelihood given the language model, so that the the arrow is pointing at the most likely one, and then it goes to the next most likely one. They are writing in German; they're not being aggressive. And this is actually an adaptation of a system that we'd built for accelerometer-based input, which had used a bunch of other um, techniques for text entry, where you would tilt the, the phone and fly through these letter groups, uh, but it was adapted for, for a BCI. So you see there, the, the user missed the target, they were going for an N, but they didn't get it in time, had to wait, so it came around again and hopefully get it this time. Yay. Okay, so that's an example of something which is slightly different to your, your Windows interface. Um, and what's also interesting is, for this user, they had high bandwidth feedback, so they could see a rich display, they could also hear and feel, so the number of bits per second you could communicate from the system to the human was high, but from the human to the system was very low, so we were um, down at about seven and a half characters a minute. So it's interesting to look at how do you design for systems which have got asymmetry in the, the channel capacity. Here's a, another one. Um, I mean, one of the other, actually just before we leave the BCI, one of the other really interesting things about BCI is that the role of models there is much more appreciated than in normal HCI. So if you're designing something for a PC or for a phone, then getting a model that describes how you do things is actually quite complicated because of the complication in the interface. Mm -hmm. And the value of that model is somewhat reduced because other approaches can work well. Whereas with BCI, because every user is so different, and because the cost of interaction is so high, <clears throat> the role of a model in predicting whether a given user will be able to use this a particular style of interface is much more important. So I had a PhD student, Melissa Quek, who did a thesis on using learning to identify somebody. You'd get a user to perform various basic tasks with a BCI, build up a model of how they could perform, and then you could try that model automatically in a range of interface possibilities to give them something that would work for them because the level of complexity that was appropriate for different users would depend on their performance. So it's a good example of where user modeling was very important. Okay, Mood Agent is an app for mobile devices. You can download it for your um, smartphones, Android, iOS, Windows, mobile, uh, from a company called Synthetic. We've been working with them for years, um, helping develop this. And it lets you generate playlists automatically. Um, so you can, it can categorize all the music on your device. Or if you use Spotify, you can use uh, all of Spotify's music. And what it does is it um, g links tracks to subjective values like sensual, erotic, aggressive, but also genres like jazz, rock, um, etc. And you can use an interface like this where you have sliders where you say, I'd like to have a playlist which has got some very happy, slightly sensual and non-aggressive music, and it will generate a set of songs using that um, that um, fits your life, and you can use that to access tracks and Spotify as well. Um, so it's part of discovering new music. Um, so it's letting you generate playlists and recommendations for any collection. It's got, uh, I think, 15 million installs on mobile devices, millions of Spotify users. Um, and they've, they've analyzed 60 million tracks, so they've got quite rich data sets. Um, 
and that can be used to help people explore the music. So how does that, how's it using machine learning? Well, basically, you, you get the raw MP3 file, so you could record your own music in your garage, stick it into the system, and they would be able to analyze it. It's not depending on metadata from some other provider, and it's not depending on a human labeling your individual track. So basically, you get the raw track. They've got an algorithm for finding an interesting area of music because, for example, the start or the end of a track are often not characteristic of that music. Um, that chunk is then analyzed using a bunch of standard low-level signal processing algorithms. So you, you get autoregressive coefficients, MEL frequency, Kepstra coefficients, a number of things which are quite common in, for example, speech um, recognition. And then what we use is a Gaussian process ordinal regression model. So you're linking these objective values to labels between 1 and 7. So what we have is a bunch of music students rating a few thousand tracks where for each of these values, whether it's sensual, whether it's erotic, what the tempo is, whether it's jazz, they'll put a 1 to 7 value on it. So that's an ordinal regression task. So you've got a mapping from these objective measures of the track to these subjective estimates for some tracks and the systems then to generalize this for new tracks. Um, so that gives what they call a high-definition music profile. So you're generating a 35-dimensional sort of space, um, which has a range of features of the, the music. So, yeah, let's just go through that process. And what I'm going to show is a little demo where we've now taken that high-dimensional space, because on the the app that you can download, you only have six of the dimensions to play with you. You have the moods that you can um, change and the tempo. Um, but there's much richer data there. And so we use a low dimensional projection, in this case, um, TSNE, the stochastic neighbor embedding, um, to let you explore what's going on. And we then take that low dimensional projection, because that's just showing where the high dimensional points are, and we create Gaussian processes to summarize each of the variables of interest that you want the user to explore. So there's a range of different dimensionality reduction techniques you could use. Um, we, went, we found TSNE was giving us quite nice results, but uh, you could slot in your favorite, favorite method there. So how well does it seem to be doing? Here are a few plots of the genre data, and you see you know, related things seem to be reasonably close together. So folk and blues and easy listening are in one corner, electronica and hip hop in another. So at a first, first glance, that looks not too bad. Um, so what we did was we had a, a master student um, working with us for a few months, um, uh, Beatrix Vath from uh, Munich, and she built uh, a nice demo that brought together the Mood Agent API, Spotify, and built a web app that uh, would allow you to explore your music collection. So the idea here is that you can look at a range of different uh, features and explore tracks that are neighboring and maybe draw a trajectory that you would like to take your music from erotic to sensual to, um, to upbeat. Um, let me, so this is probably easier to... Okay, so here's our music collection. Um, if I start to wander around, it's showing me a cloud of tracks around any one area. If I linger there, what you'll see, it's not so good on the projector, um, but basically you're seeing an area going a bit more red. That's the erotic area. Here's the happy one. Um, there's the angry one. And so this is showing you the activity level of a Gaussian process fitted to that particular variable conditioned on the X and Y position of the low dimensional space. So Niels promised me to get his GPLVM working properly so that we can actually connect the whole thing together. But uh, uh, it's there, is it? Almost. Yeah. So, but the, so because here we, you know, we haven't done the proper thing of linking these two stages together, but because we've got a GP ordinal regression model, we could actually link the, 
the two together. This is a bit of a hack, but part of what we were wanting to do is to explore what happens when you show people uncertain information. So if I go out here, you see this is a visualization that's saying, okay, whichever one is the greatest wins that area and colors, you know, the, that coloring, and that gives you some what look like hard borders. But what we found in the past is that when you have hard borders, people tend to linger at that border and cross back and forth across that border to see, does this work? Is there a difference between uh, erotic and happy? And how, you know, what happens if I go back and forth across this border? And, but if you actually look at that, if I look at the individual ones, again, it's hard, <coughs> it's hard to see on the display, but if anybody wants a proper look, they can come up at the end and try the, the demo. But the yellow is actually fading very gradually across. So there's no, although you can make a cut there, statistically it would be, do, there's actually not a significant difference. I go to the red, and again, it leaks out into other areas, and there are some things like uh, um, the purple, which is leaking out over the whole space. So what we wanted to do was to see, oh, by the way, if you want to create a trajectory, then you can do that, and it starts Spotify, and starts to extract tracks from Spotify. So, and if anybody, how many of you use Spotify? Okay. Ladies up in here tonight, no fighting. We got the refugees. No fighting. Yeah. No fighting. Shakira, Shakira. I never really knew that she could dance like this. Yeah. She make a man. So, one of the problems people have when using a service like Spotify is that they tend to be forced to use text to think of what would I want to do now. What's been happening? Okay, um, so you're, you're forced to come up with uh, some text, a name, a, a track, and often people just kind of go, Ugh, and they revert to whatever they've recently been listening to. Or, so they tend not to explore anything like as much as they could if they were given the appropriate tools. So one of the goals, and this has been seen many times where people were given an all-you-can-eat music collection, was they very, the first day or two they, they listened to lots of things that they've listened to before, but then there's very little exploration a blip of exploration, very little exploration, a blip of exploration. So this is about exploring how can you use the inference from the machine learning part to make easier the task of the human to see what do I like, what do I don't like. And we can look at how do people, these are heat maps of users using this over a number of weeks with different visualizations and we're wanting to see does highlighting the Gaussian process information showing the different regions change the way they explore things compared to just having a point cloud. Um, and again, that's an example of a, a fairly tricky machine learning task, um, is how to infer what people were trying to do from mouse movements, what were their intentions. You need to have a model of how do they normally move the mouse and try to infer what could that mean about what they were trying to achieve at that point. Another thing that I think would be interesting to, to see whether the machine learning community has got any ideas on is how should we be making these low dimensional projections for this purpose? Because at the moment we're doing something which is trying to do a, a sensible low dimensional mapping so that points in the high dimensional space are close to together in the low dimensional space as well. But actually you saw me generating playlists as trajectories there. Could we have a visualization which changes the aesthetic properties of the display so that frequently generated playlists will look aesthetically pleasing. That might mean that they're just smooth. Uh, so if, I, if we find that lots of people want to do a particular type of playlist, should we create a space that does its best to keep related songs close together, but in such a way that these frequently desired trajectories are also aesthetically pleasing? That could be an interesting challenge for uh, the machine learning community. Um, should we create nodes or landmarks which make it easier for people to organize themselves? Um, I've included some, so some interesting work where some Japanese researchers used um, some oatmeal and slime mold to recreate the Tokyo train network. So they took an area that was mapped out to look like um, Tokyo Bay and 
put oatmeal in proportion to population density on a, a, an area filled with slime mould, and the slime mould recreated a network which was very similar to what Japan Rail had evolved over 150 years. So could we use similar ideas to learn centres of what people listen to and how they get from one thing to the other and create a more meaningful low-dimensional space? Similarly, everybody works on fancy low-dimensional projection methods, but they often don't give it give designers a way to control that. <clears throat> so if you're working with the design team, they will often want to have some sort of metaphor for what this space means. That they might they might think it's more natural to have low tempo on the left and high tempo on the right. Or if this was I was uh, uh, talking to somebody who is working on using this in a uh, systems biology application where you had something evolving over time and in their visualization that had a distribution going in a, not a left to right fashion as you might expect. So if you were creating a textbook and you wanted to visualize this image, you might want to twist the space and have it uh, in some format that made more sense in that context. So how can you allow designers to tweak the low dimensional projection um, in such a way that it's more meaningful um, or fits with a brand image or, you know, so you could place a music map onto the map of Europe and just associate different areas with different types of music. Um, so I think that's an interesting challenge for, for the machine learning communities to allow human designers to seed and direct the, uh, the format of low dimensional projections to help with some broader context. Um, so I think mood agent is quite an interesting one. It's a modern exam I think an example of modern challenges for interaction design. We've got some complex signal processing generating features. We've got um, human experts tagging the data with subjective classifications. Uh, you're using rich models like Gaussian process ordinal regression models to relate these and to make predictions for new content. But all of these stages have got lots of uncertainty associated with them. And there are limits, you know, cultural aspects, irony, are things that are difficult for algorithms to understand. Um, but you can learn from uh, millions of other people. So you've got millions of other people using the system. Can they fill in the gaps that the automatic system can't? How do you build an interactive system that encourages them to do that, that they see value from doing that? How do you bring the skills that each of these agents has to bear on the problem? So. One of the interesting challenges, a few years ago, people were wanting to create intelligent agents that would go off and do things for you. They would buy your, your tickets, they would negotiate your wages, whatever. Um, and you can see that in the model for some um, search engines. So you had Ask Jeeves, which had this butler-like character that would, uh, you would ask questions and they would tell you answers or do things for you. But should we be thinking about the goal for intelligent systems as being... Uh, a butler who can interpret what you're doing and go off and represent you? Or should we think of it more like a, a horse or a dog? If you think about an example here, you've got a human on a, a horse or a human on a bike. Um, the rider of the horse has to read the horse. The horse reads the rider's intentions via body language, um, gait, pulling on the reins. So you've got a horse that can work autonomously, it can make decisions, it can uh, go in a particular direction, and you can encourage it to go in that direction. Um, each of these situations has uh, strengths and weaknesses. I mean, the rider on the bike is having to do everything themselves. They're having to keep stable, they're having to look around at, uh, for obstacles, so that, for example, a policeman on a horse would be able to spend more time looking at a crowd, for example, than somebody on a bike, because the person on the bike has to deal with low-level features. Um, so should we be thinking about the technical system as being more like the horse, and then look at how you can pull the reins, because sometimes you want to have tight rein control, where you tell the horse exactly where you want to go. Other times you're prepared to have loose rein control, and you leave things up to the, the horse to, to deal with. Um, only intervening now and again if you want to have a change of direction. So you've got this smooth ebb and flow of control between the human and the machine. 
rather than a dialogue of instructions and responses. And it means that, for example, if the horse is going into an environment where it does not feel comfortable, it's being taken down a slope that's too steep or where it's too uh, loose ground, it can provide haptic feedback, it can push back and say, no, I'm not comfortable with this. And that might encourage you, as the, in the managing role, to, to change direction and to move in a different route. So the H metaphor is an approach that was developed by um, Flemish, um, at NASA, and it was relating to how you deal with autopilots in something like the Space Shuttle. And you're dealing with something which is making intelligent decisions, so you've got two intelligent systems coming together. <coughs> and so this interaction with the horse was used as an analogy for the handover of autonomy in computer systems as the certainty of control varies. So in a horse, if the rider is using frequent deliberate movements, the horse follows these movements exactly. As the control becomes more vague, the horse can resort to its familiar behavioural patterns and it takes over more of the control. So this loosening and tightening of the reins of control is going to be, I think, a defining feature of intelligent systems in the future that you should be able to, when you don't want to generate too many bits per second and be too attentive to a system, be able to let it do its thing, but you should be able to take control when you need to, potentially when you don't trust, in a particular context, where you don't trust the skills of the technical system to deal with it, um, or when it alerts you to the fact that it, it is uncomfortable. And you can relate this to, there's a, a diagram here showing a, a hierarchical control system with inner loops, which are the more nitty gritty of everyday activity, outer loops, which are gradual adaptations, so machine learning can be used in each of these layers, uh, but the tightening the reins is pulling you in towards the inner loop and making you control the system in more detail. So this, the, this thinking about the H metaphor got us thinking about design for these systems and thinking about how to categorize technical systems. And we think it's important that you should be able to design systems so that you can work with them in a casual or engaged manner. So usually you're assuming the user is fully attending to the system. That means they're receiving all the feedback you send and that every action that they generate is of meaning. And this becomes even more important if you're using something like a Kinect uh, where the system is continuously trying to look for gestures and interpret what's going on. But <clears throat> as we've seen already, that's not always possible. People are often uh, focusing on other things. So in this case, he should be focusing on her, but he's not. He's going to pay for it later, you can tell. Um, here, somebody's at the end of a long day. They're knackered, they're stressed. They don't want to make more decisions. They don't want to engage particularly deeply with the system. So when they come home and they want to listen to music, they'd like to just wave a hand and get some basic genre of music, but they don't care too much about exactly what. However, after a few minutes, they might go, oh, that sounds interesting, and then they, f they, ha they want to engage, and they need to, at that point, be able to change the way they, they interface with the system. Or, again, they might have a bunch of other things they're having to deal with, things they're carrying, other stresses. They might be in a dangerous situation. It might be a, a nurse working in a hospital, uh, and some piece of machinery is demanding attention, which she can't give because she's trying to save somebody's life. It could be somebody driving a car. So if you view the engaged end of the spectrum as having accurate and timely control, which means you have pre precise execution of commands, vague and uncertain input would be the system having to take over some control. And you could imagine a scale of engagement where from low engagement to high engagement, you've got general changes in the environment that are sensed by some smart sensors around. You might have undirected waving as activating something, but not precisely what. Squeezing the device might be, you know, I, my phone could ring and I could just give it a quick squeeze. I haven't looked to see who called. I haven't done anything detailed. I just uh, tapped or squeezed the device. I might have some particular multi-finger pat on the device to activate a particular feature. Or I might have tightly coupled closed loop interaction, like playing a game where I'm moving my finger in continuous contact and with low delays to any responses. So you can characterize these changes as in focused and uh, ca casual interaction. 
focus interaction is frequent, accurate sampling, low latency responses, extended periods of continuous control, a high channel capacity from the outputs to their sensors, so it's high empowerment in the technical sense. Um, casual interaction is going to degrade elements of that control loop. You might have intermittent interactions, so you're interacting in short bursts over time. You might have um, an asymmetry in the interaction loop where you can perceive a lot but not act much, or vice versa. Um, um, and so that means that overall you have a lower channel capacity to, from your outputs to the sensors. Okay, and this brings in a whole bunch of design challenges about how you build systems like that, how the metaphors are made clear to people when they can engage in a range of ways and where their inputs mean different things in different settings. Okay, so let's look more at rich input. This is um, work by Daryl Weir, Simon Rogers and Marcus Lüftefeld uh, in Glasgow, and it was looking at mobile touch and machine learning there. So if anybody has a smartphone and you're on the local network, you can actually start generating some data now. So I'd encourage you, for once in a lecture, take out your phones, <laughs> open your browser, and go to the web page there, and you can start to generate some data that makes the rest of this session make sense to you. So on you go. Don't be shy. So this is the web address you need to go to. So when you get it up, you'll start to see some targets. Just try, hold the device in your hand and just tap on them as you would as if you were writing a message. And it will also be different. If you change it to use your left hand, you'll get different offsets again. And it relates to the physiology of your hand and your typing behavior and your model of what touch is. Um, but I'll, I'll go on with the talk. Keep on doing it and you'll, you'll see that you, you have interesting offsets. But basically, each time it started off in an initial condition and each time you hit a target, you'll have had a, an offset and you gradually moved. In this case, it moved this way. Um, that's showing the typical offsets that would be applied at that point in space to give you a more precise touch. So what happens when you're actually doing this? What do you think about when you touch a screen? Where, where are you actually communicating? Because the targets that you're hitting are typically smaller than the overall size of your finger. So what part of your finger do you think about as being the touch point? And that varies. Different people think of different things. Many people think about something just below the fingertip at the, the fingernail at the front. Uh, other people might, depends on whether you've got long fingernails or not, they might use other ways of typing. But everybody has a slightly different mental model of how to type. And what they do depends also on which phone they've used, because once you start to close the loop and get feedback, you'll change your behavior. And people touch differently on different phones, because each of these phones does things differently. And people had used polynomial models before, uh, trained on large numbers of data from large numbers of people. Uh, the um, novelty in this work was using a rich nonlinear model, a Gaussian process prior, trained individually on a, on a single user. And we used the Nokia N9, which is a really nice phone for this sort of research because it's basically Linux based and very open. So we were able to get information from the individual pads on the, the capacitive uh, screen. And depending on the target size you're going for, the improvement you can get by learning an offset model can be significant. So if you're going for very small targets, you, you, we were getting a 23% improvement. And the offsets that were learned were very nonlinear. So this is being held like this in landscape fashion. And so you can see the effect of somebody using left and right hand uh, input. This is the horizontal offset, so sort of halfway point in the phone, they're changing. And the vertical offset, you can see the lines in the um, the structure of the, the, the offsets changing depending on where you are. But they're user specific, so this person did something quite different. So you can learn these models to improve the touch performance for users. And you can also look at the uncertainty, so you can see where they're more precise and less precise because you're using a Gaussian process prior. Um, now that one was using about 200 points to get good performance. We'd like to reduce that and do that faster because nobody's going to generate 200 inputs to calibrate their brand new phone. So further paper, uh, further paper uh, led by Daryl uh, was 
how you, relating to this H metaphor idea of how do you bring the intelligence of the human together with the intelligence of the algorithm. So you've got touch models using Gaussian processes to infer when I touch somewhere on the screen, what do I really mean? And um, language models saying what's likely and the decoder to help deal with that. So it's um, trying to improve things. So you've got a language model that was trained on 778 million tweets and that gives you the likelihood of different characters after typing TI. Decoder is going to combine these probabilities from the touch and the language models and find words um, for a sequence of inputs. Um, and it was we tested it on GP type, uh, which is a system just using the uncertainty in the Gaussian process regression. And force type was allowing the user, we uh, have a force sensor augmented phone, so you can press harder and it can register that. So you could register the your mistrust of the automatic algorithm for the language model um, using extra pressure. Okay, so the Gaussian process was going to give you the intended um, uh, target given your model of behavior and what was actually um, tapped. And so you're getting a distribution over locations. Um, and you can then integrate that over the keys to get the likelihood of different characters. So here's a little video showing it. Text input on modern touchscreen devices is an inherently inaccurate task. In this paper, we present a novel decoder which combines probabilities from a user-specific touch model and a statistical language model to correct for input errors. We explicitly incorporate uncertainty when searching for the most likely word given a series of touches and show that this significantly improves the quality of our corrections. In a further study, we allow users to provide certainty cues to the system and dynamically control how autocorrection is applied. Okay, so that's being presented next week at CHI. So you're getting the latest HCI results before the HCI community here. Um, so evaluated on 10 participants, um, and importantly, you're repeating the task while sitting, standing, and walking. So that's something that's important to do when you're testing these things. It's not just to do it in a lab. You have to get people doing something more realistic. Um, so you can see that the... Uh, GP type gets the lowest error rates in uh, sitting, standing and walking situations. Um, but you still have issues about autocorrect failing. And if you write multilingual text or if you're use, using Glaswegian, as we do in Glasgow, so you have heed, which means your head, scanner, is your scanner if something's gone wrong and that gets translated to scanner. That doesn't mean the same thing. Boke is certainly not the same as a vial. Um, so these are things that frustrate you if you're use, you want to use the language that is meaningful for you, but the system is trying to force you to do something else. So the force type system allowed you to apply pressure. So it wasn't really a phone, it was a, a phone keyboard stuck onto a, a pressure pad uh, with a little display over it. But it let people decide if they thought, if they predicted that the word was not going to be correctly interpreted by the system, they could just apply more pressure saying, no, I really mean this. And allowing that uh, extra pressure meant that they um, needed to have fewer corrections and they got more words per minute because they weren't correcting. So it's a nice example of the tightening the reins and the style of the H metaphor. Um, okay, just thinking. We also, another example of rich touch um, which I will skip over briefly, is using capacitive sensing. And just by analyzing the data properly and using a particle filter, we were able to create 3D touch from a normal capacitive sensor. So we also tried this out on the Nokia N9 and it worked. You could infer by having a model, which was basically a hinge and using a particle filter, what the orientation of the finger was. So that means you're taking a standard sensor, but using more intelligent analysis of it and that then increases the degrees of freedom you have as a user. And that not only, um, I'll show the video in just a second. Um, and one of, the, one of the interesting things is, as you move towards the targets, you can get uncertainty when you're above the, the device, but closer down you're getting more precision. And again, that's quite a handy thing if you want to implement these H metaphor ideas that you can give vague input 
above the device and precise ones closer down. Capacitive touchscreens can suffer from accuracy problems, especially when used one-handed, partly because they do not accurately determine the hole pose of the finger. Our system uses a particle filter to track the 3D orientation of the finger in real time, where pitch and yaw are tracked alongside the contact point. Here you can see the measured sensor outputs, compared with the particle filter's estimated sensor values. The filter is able to rapidly converge. Our system easily extends to multi-touch, even using a very small and coarse sensor array. Users performed an experiment, entering numbers on a virtual keypad. This was performed on two grid sizes, the smaller of which was around the size of a user's thumb. The experiment was replicated exactly on an iPhone to determine the relative performance of our algorithm. These are the inferred touch positions using our model. The results using simple linear interpolation are significantly poorer. And the replication on the iPhone also shows poorer performance. On the smaller grid, the model still performs well. Interpolation and the iPhone's algorithm are next to useless at this size. <coughs> Our model automatically compensates for different grip positions. Here a left-hander has markedly different offsets using the simple linear interpolation. The distributions of angles, which can be shown using our model, vary significantly between the forefinger and the thumb, thus allowing the system to compensate for the variations in touching. So other, other ways in which you can um, control devices is you can use, you know, most of these things have got microphones, you could speak to them, but you can also use the microphones for other uh, purposes. So some games have been doing simple things like uh, picking up the sound of uh, blowing, which is a you know, broad spectrum noise to control the system. Um, we have uh, oops, a system that we built which could, using a contact microphone, would pick up the sound of you rubbing your finger on the sides of uh, an object. See the video here. And could use a neural net to classify different um, regions in there. The surface texture is formed to enable a wide variety of scratching motions while guiding the fingers along the contours. Piezo microphones record the vibrations while rejecting background noise. The stain is used to control a media player. By scratching different regions, the user can change the volume and navigate through tracks. The audio is transformed into control signals by classifying the short-term Fourier transform with a neural network. The sounds of scratching different areas are clearly separable. Even using the soft parts of the fingers, rubbing different areas results in markedly different spectra. You often find new ways of, of, of doing things with sensors and um, that's where machine learning can offer possibilities to systems designers that they'd never thought of before. Um, and you can also, you've got some interesting inverse problems, so you could 
imagine nowadays you, anybody can make one of these cases with a 3D printer. So you could look at the inverse problem. So what structure should that case be to interact with a particular uh, digit or stylus or whatever in order to create a code set that you can then disambiguate for the interface. So you've got some interesting learning challenges you can create. As how many codes can you create with a particular aesthetic um, on a particular shape of objects that can be distinguished? So there's a challenge for a student project if you want one. Um, OK, so a few general things that have been coming out through this. We like to talk about negotiated interaction. So you're saying the users are interacting with content and services in the environment. We can have continuous actions, and they're negotiating the interactions and the intentions in a fluid, dynamic manner. But it's shaping the load, share the, sharing the load, sorry, where you're not trying to get the system to do everything on its own, but you're getting the user to intervene at times and to support them. So we're spreading, spreading the inference process over time. You've got a high-dimensional belief state, but the user wants to drive that into a particular state to get things done. However, the user actions that are doing that driving are noisy, imperfectly controlled, imperfectly planned, and the interface sensors are measuring these activities in non-transparent ways to the user. So you need to have a map from that intended communication and what is sensed by the system and feeding that back to the user. So one thing that's been kind of irritating me in human-computer interaction is how do you actually go about measuring interaction? We've got this field, but the actual fund foundations of it seem quite shaky. Nobody's given me a good definition of interaction. Um, so, I mean, any measure you pick has got to involve implicitly or explicitly human behavior. Interaction is going to be some kind of action which involves two bodies having an effect on one, of, on one another. It has to be a two-way effect. Um, so it's not just a system, one system driving another completely. They have to be driving each other. Um, they're controlling each other's behavior. And that has a special case of communication. And that can be when the control and communication is intended and unintended. So how many of you have heard of empowerment in the technical sense? Uh, Klubin and Polanyi. They, they, basically, it's a definition of empowerment. You're highly empowered if you can send a lot of information from your actuators through the environment and sense them again. So the channel capacity of the path from your actuators to your sensors. Because it's basically saying you can act on the world, change something, and that's changed in a predictable manner. Um, and it was suggested um, in the robotics and artificial life community where people are looking at evolving sensory motor control systems. Uh, but it's building on work from powers from the early 70s and looking at behavior as what happens when you control what you perceive. Um, so you're, it's an information theoretic capacity of an agent's actuation channel. Um, you've got a focus on control, so it's not, you know, mutual information wouldn't give you that control element to it. Um, and I think it's quite an interesting framework to think about. But if anybody has a, a better suggestion for measuring interaction, I'd be quite keen to, to hear it. So the impairment gives you a focus on actuation. It's linking perception and action. Not all actions lead to perceivably different results. Um, of course, there are lots of details as to how you implement it. You, as in everything in information theory, getting the distributions is going to be tricky. And the time scale over which you calculate impairment is important. Um, and, you know, you can think about things like Facebook. If you never got a response to any updates you put on Facebook, you'd pretty quickly stop it. Or if the responses you got were completely unpredictable, that sometimes you've got lots of hateful messages because of something you thought was quite innocuous and other times you put something exciting up and nobody responded. If you felt you could not control the responses you got from the environment, you would quickly stop doing it. Um, is it interesting to be close to objects that you can manipulate because that increases your degrees of freedom. It gives you the potential to access more states in the future. So I think that the suggestion that the measure of impairment is giving us is that we want to give users the ability to create control loops which combine different groups of output and input uh, channels so they're able to create different meaningful interactions themselves. Um, let's see how we're doing for time. Okay. 
one of the, the things that's often overlooked is the feedback of uncertain information because we've got, if we've got poor information, we can't control it. So this is an example of a ship that ran aground because it was giving very precise looking information to the captain, but the GPS system had uh, switched off and it was on dead reckoning and actually it was a very uncertain position, but it was being represented as certainty. They didn't notice a little bit of the display that said, by the way, this is now in dead reckoning mode and they ran the ship aground because of that. Um, and there was work by Daniel Walpert on controlling a robot arm where they could disturb the, um, the robot and you, your arm was under the table so you couldn't see that yourself and they could choose a range of levels of precision from precise information, noisy, more noisy and no feedback. And what they found was that people essentially regularized their behavior. They were good Bayesians, they, made, they performed smoother motions when they had less information to work from. So our thinking was, well, if we can actually generalize this through the whole computer, the whole interaction process, if we give appropriate uncertain information, then people should regularize their behavior appropriately and not put in more effort when it's not something that can be justified based on the feedback that you've got. So we've got some examples for location aware systems because when you're out and about, you've got a, a location, but that's uncertainty because uncertain because of the GPS. You can have augmented reality systems which change depending on where you're pointing. But the magnetometer often has about a 20 degree uncertainty. So you need to take that into account. So here, this is as if you're looking, this is in Maynooth where I used to work part time. Um, this is a university campus, you're looking at it from above and this is somebody turning and moving around with their device and the system's showing where it thinks they are and if they tilt the phone forward then they want to know something about something which is some distance away from them so you get this vector here. Now you're seeing, you see things changing depending on where I stand, now things are more precise. Why is that? Well if I actually look at the satellite shadows, this is showing the effect of shadowing from buildings. The, um, when I'm away from the buildings, I get precise location information, but when I move into a, a shadow of a building, then it can see fewer satellites, I get less precise information. So it's a simple example of that. And what if, for example, the, so I'm, I'm now pointing this way, the system's diffusing, saying, well, you, you know, if you continue to go that way, you could be there, there, and there, but then, it uses the accelerometers on the device to infer that I'm on a bike. And then it knows that actually, it's probably easier if I start off on a bike path, that I'm going to stick to a bike path. So the inference changes to assume that I'll be sticking to bike paths, whereas if I wasn't on a bike, it would assume a different behavior. So you can have these predictions of what the user is going to do and take into account uncertainty. And if you actually do that, because even just pointing, you've got a lot of uncertainty in the bearing. This is the sort of readings you get from the, the magnetometer. Um, these were results from people following paths with uncertain feedback or with certain feedback. And in most cases, you had significantly faster acquisition times when you gave the users uncertain feedback, when that uncertainty reflected the true uncertainty of the system. Um, and I think we've got lots of interesting challenges in making the inference processes from all the clever algorithms that you develop tangible to the user and help them to grasp what's, what's going on. And sometimes we might want to link quite complex methods to the parameterization of simple pseudo-mechanical systems. And as a little demo of that, we've got another system that we built called Shugel, which is a good Scots word for shaking. Um, it should be coming up any moment. Shugel is a novel auditory and tactile interface. Information is excited by shaking. Although Shugel is totally non-visual, for demonstration purposes, we show here a visualization. Stimulated balls bounce around, producing audio and vibrotactile feedback as they impact. Here, an inbox is displayed. Each message becomes a virtual ball. 
the user can send messages without interrupting their reading. Different message senders have different timbres. Shugle can be used passively as well as actively. With the device in the user's pocket, gate motion is sensed by the accelerometers. As messages arrive in the inbox, they sound like keys jangling in the user's pocket, giving a subtle sense of awareness. So that's just an example of how you can create a simple pseudo-physical simulation and then link inference methods. So we had another version where you had a language model that could run on the content, so you could shake and tell what language the messages were in. So was this a work message? Was it from home? Who sent it? You could have different subspaces that you excite for different uh, senders. So it's trying to build up these kind of physical things but link them to information processing. Um, okay, I think I'll... So we're going to see wearable computing spreading sensors all around our body now, and that will give us even richer information. And one of the big challenges for the machine learning there is get this Midas touch issue that if you're continuously being sensed, uh, everything you touch could turn into gold, essentially. So everything, everything you do might be interpreted as an action. So having robust measures of the variability of everyday actions and ways of declutching control uh, systems is going to be a major challenge. Okay, so do we have the right tools for the job? You know, we've got the probability theory letting us bring high-level reasoning and low-level signal analysis in at the same time for interaction. We can, we'll need to work out what sort of metaphors and um, to link these two. We need to think about how we allow propagate, propagation of uncertainty within UI toolkits, because that's contra contrary to most computing science um, approaches. And we need to work a lot on the feedback of uncertainty, representing uncertainty in real time to users. Um, and, it, you know, typically people have traditionally done lots of things in MATLAB, but that isn't great if you're trying to port it to mobile devices. So we're seeing more, more and more of a movement towards using like, things like Python. Um, let's see. And why would you guys want to do HCI? Well, I think there are lots of challenging problems. There are lots of um, fun things to do. You, one thing that's really nice is you can create your own training data, you can build a system and you can test it without depending on other people. So you can grab lots of data. Uh, many of you will be in the situation where you've been given some pile of data that was created several years ago. The people who did it have moved on. You're, you've no idea why that's there, um, but you're supposed to work with that. Here you can actually be in control, you can do everything yourself. So you get to be exposed to full systems thinking. And in terms of things like the gender balance of conference, it's a much more even one. You meet a more, a more normal cross-section of humanity, I think, than, uh, than if you're stuck at the machine learning conference. So it's something worth trying, at least. Um, if you're interested in having a go, if, even if it's just coming for a few months, if you want to try and uh, try these things out in Glasgow, uh, come and talk to me afterwards or send me an email, because we quite often take uh, interns over the summer for a few months, so you could work on one of these problems. OK. Questions? Okay. Will the QWERTY keyboard ever die? Please. Do you not like it? Um, it's one of these things that shows how much investment there's been in people learning to use something and how difficult it is once that investment's been made to shake that off. So, um, your, your guess is as good as mine. But I think, you know, you've, you saw for a while, for example, that people were becoming quite skilled. While we still had um, traditional keypads, people, many teenagers were very skilled at using that, uh, and they still quite like that as an input mechanism. So you could argue it's already diversified a lot, but, uh, there's always going to be a problem if, you, if you've got a lot of expectation that something's in a particular place, then yeah, it's hard to get rid of. I wanted to ask that in the, uh, in the earlier part of your talk, you mentioned that uh, for these compu human computer interaction systems, mm -hmm. um, sometimes user has to control the system and sometimes systems control the user. Yeah. So in that scenario, how do we define the context? Could you have some example? So 
Well, the context, so you, how do we define the context yeah. when people, so when some, one person is controlling the other, when, so yeah. I think it's going to be, even in one context, you can switch between the system controlling you and you controlling it within that same context. Um, so it's not going to be that you go into a different context and then suddenly you're being controlled. It's going to be something which is fluid, but the, the style of controls, the meaning of your actions changes depending on the situation. So, for example, you might have a document. Imagine we built a, a tilt-based document browser, so you could have a small screen device and you could tilt it. And when you started off tilting, it was just making minor changes to where you were in the document, but you could build up speed. And then it moved to a kind of semantic zoom where you had more of an overview of the document and you were flying through at high speed. But if you saw something that was related to your interest, you could stop and then it changed context to a position control mode where it brought up a crosshairs and you were trying in a sense to bomb the text. You were trying to hit a particular part of the text to start reading again. And so the system was taking the same <coughs> physical inputs, the tilt input, but changing its interpretation of them and controlling in the sense that it was stabilizing your actions, assuming that you were trying to perform a certain task. So it thought initially you were just wanting to travel at a certain velocity through the document. Then it realized you were trying to land on part of the document, so it tried to help stabilize you on that and change the interpretation of the inputs to changing the reference target for where you were landing. So you can have systems which try and constrain the interpretation of your actions or can try and give you guidance according to the context, what they think is meaningful. If I realized it was trying to help me land at a particular position, but I didn't actually intend to do that, I need to have some way of bumping the system out of that and telling it, no, no, I didn't mean that. Uh, so this issue of how well you understand the, what it thinks of as different contexts and the support it will give you in those contexts is important so that you can recognize what it's trying to do and say, no, no, that's not what I wanted. I'm, I'm going to keep on browsing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.